Yes. <laughs> um, a lot of audience interest in sort of obvious question. Um, let me put it provocatively. Is the crisis of the euro over? You want to tackle that with your comments, please? Well, now we are really going into very depressing topics. <laughs> Uh, and let me start uh, perhaps uh, a little bit uh, from Diana backwards. I think that uh, if the euro zone breaks up, collapses, that is going to be the beginning of the collapse of the single market and eventually could be the collapse of the European Union. Uh, all of that bad enough for Europe. And if all of that happens, I think uh, also horrible things will happen in the rest of the world. I think that would be the beginning of the end of our contemporary globalization. It will be such an economic disaster. Uh, we will see within a few years going into trade and currency wars and we will really see a, a dramatic process of disintegration. I am, you know, absolutely convinced so that that is the case. You don't think that things are just a little bit safer, that those things are well, less likely okay, to happen? Let, let, let well, I would say not so much. I mean, the only significant thing that has happened over the last few months, only one, you know, that was Mario Draghi's statement that the European Central Bank will be willing to do this yeah. government bond operation. Yeah. Now, but that is not enough, because uh, markets at some point will realize, number one, that the country to which that was offered, which was Spain, uh, immediately started to be reluctant to say when, how, and where they would do the package that would allow them to be in the position to have their paper bought by the, by the ECB. Uh, so that's just one example. Uh, and there is this whole story over three years of how the Europeans have always been behind the curve. Only in the last moment they have been able to do something to prevent the collapse. And I don't think you can be playing that game uh, for too long. It's extremely risky. Right now, as we speak, the Europe is in recession. I mean, the, the continental economies are in recession. The political and social condition is deteriorating so quickly. I, mean, uh, I, I happen to read El País, uh, the Spanish newspaper, uh, every day, because it's a very good uh, global newspaper. And it's just striking how bad the social and political condition, even the risk of fragmentation of Spain is now being entertained. I mean, that has been always there, but this economic crisis uh, has been a catalyzer for this Catalonia, Basque, and so on, uh, separatism. So my fear is that one of these days, you know, they will have a bank run, and then it will be very hard to react and too late to react. I mean, technically, the answer is uh, very simple. If you want to have a monetary union, you have to put other ingredients into the soup. You need fiscal union or fiscal, strong fiscal uh, coordination. You need to have an explicit, well-defined, well-institutionalized lender of last resort. To do this, I mean, now we know notionally that is the ECB, but that is not formal. Eventually, you have to have a banking union. And I would say, in a few decades, if you really believe in the European project, which I think is so important for Europe and for the world, well, you have to have something that approaches the United States of Europe. But none of the crucial elements are really being um, implemented in a solid, uh, you know, strategic way. There are things here and there, and I am afraid that the risk of having a disaster is still considerably high. Uh, UK, of course, isn't in the Eurozone, but it, yeah, because you have been a strong advocate for political integration, and we've been involved in the politics of Europe. 
where do you see it? Well, I think Ernesto's analysis is basically right. The, 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 the problem that you've got with the single currency, and it's a very interesting uh, lesson in politics, actually. The single currency um, was an idea motivated by politics, but expressed the economics. And that, that's its problem. So basically what happened was when we created the single currency zone, I actually remember um, a dinner that we had, this was just before the single currency came into effect, I'd just become uh, prime minister, we weren't joining ourselves, but we were having a debate about the way the single currency began. And basically one group of leaders sitting around the table said, look, maybe it's better we start the single currency with a core group and then we add people as their economies come into life. And that was then rejected by others who said, no, it is vital for the political integration of Europe that anyone who wants to come in can come in. And the problem then, if you take Italy, for example, when Italy came into the single currency, Italy's interest rates dropped, I don't know, seven, eight points. Now that wasn't because of something that they'd done to their economy, it was because they had essentially joined the German currency zone. So what then had to happen was that Italy then had to engage in a huge process of adjustment to make the economics align with the politics. And it didn't happen. So, you know, it's taken us 10 years to realize that Italy's not like Germany. Well. <laughs> And the difficulty now is this, and this is the point that Ernesto is making with, is that normally what would happen if you're faced with a, a huge debt problem like this, is that what you would do is you, you would devalue your currency, you would grow and you would make structural reform. The problem is with ins inside the single currency zone, you can't do that. Right. So the, you're absolutely right that the, the, the um, the actions of the European Central Bank has eased the liquidity problem, but they haven't, that on its own cannot deal with the two other issues, which are the solvency question, um, particularly in relation to the banking system, and the growth question, because if you don't get growth, then it's very hard for you. Yeah, so my view is we are right, you know, at the edge of this at the moment. I mean, I hope, for the reasons that have just been, been, been given by the President, I hope that we can come through this. Um, the stakes are immensely high, but I personally think the only thing that works is short term, what I would call a kind of grand bargain in which Germany stands behind the single currency completely and the measures that are necessary are taken. And then long term, frankly, Europe's got to reform its social systems. And it's got to reform them, by the way, for long term reasons. That are the same reason you in the US have got to do a certain amount of reform, um, why we in the UK have to. And again, reasons like demography. In, in the 1980s, the average age of the European population was early 30s. Today it's early 40s. You know, technology, oh, yeah. the way the states develop, all of these things create the need for change. So I think on, for Europe right now, um, no, we're not out of the woods. There is, there is a renewed political will, but it's still uh, immensely fragile, and the stakes we're playing for in the world economy are very, very high. Well, I would just take a step to the one thing, which is the, the one way to look at it is the states that seem fiscally irresponsible need to reform. Another way to look at it is if you look at an integrated currency area like the United Kingdom or the United States, you have rich regions and poor regions, and by having a fiscal authority, the rich regions subsidize the poor regions. So we don't ask Mississippi to get its house in order. We basically transfer, uh, we basically transfer funds there. And poor labor mobility. And labor mobility gives yeah. people out. Yeah. yeah. So it's a, it's a little, little, I mean, you, I think I agree with Vanessa, we need a fiscal. We ultimately need to have a integrated fiscal. Right, but the moment you do that, you will find there is enormous pressure for political institutions That's right. that reflect that. That's right. It's also very, very tough. Yeah. So, anyway. <laughs> so, I always say to people at the moment, whenever I'm talking the world, well, first of all, we talk about the Middle East, and then we talk about Europe, and then everyone gets really depressed. So, I say, let's talk about Africa, because I'm optimistic about that. It's been a bright spot over the last five, seven years. That's true.